everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Got a great show for you today. We're going to be talking about omega fats, and we're going to do a crash course on omega-3, omega-6, and omega-9. So, you know, pay attention. We're going to dive into not only what they do, what are their functions, what kind of diseases, what kind of symptoms they're related to when they're deficient, but we're also going to talk about how much you can take, how much you should take for certain situations. And like always, we're going to be taking your questions at the end. Please try to keep your questions relevant to the topic at hand. I'll do my best to answer as many as I can. And again, if you're new to the show, um, you know, first come, first serve. So get your questions in early to get them answered. Otherwise, we may not get to them. So let's dive into omega-3 fatty acids, so, or rather omega fats. So what, what are omega fats? Now, they're generally speaking, these omega fats are fats that are considered to be essential. What does essential mean? Essential means that your body cannot produce them. You have to eat them. And so you can't eat other kinds of fats and your body make omegas three and six from those other kinds of fat. In essence, you have to, you have to eat them from your diet. And we'll talk about food sources here in just a minute. But the two primary types of Polyunsaturated fats are omega-3 and omega-6. And the, the term poly means multiple. Unsaturated means that their carbon bonds are not saturated with hydrogen. We're not going to go into the depth of chemistry because I don't, I, th I don't think it will serve most of you. But um, it's important to understand that the more unsaturated a fat is, so this poly, the more susceptible the fat is to oxidation. Meaning, this is important, especially if you're trying to do supplements with omega-3 fatty acid supplemental pills. A lot of supplements, and I see this is that manufacturers are guilty of this all the time. You'll see a bottle, um, and it'll be a clear bottle, like a plastic clear bottle on the outside. Um, and the fat is in it, and you can see the fat. And I, a lot of your major box stores, I see this all the time, where they'll be like selling omega-3 fats in bulk, these big old bottles. With clear plastic, you can see right through. And the problem with that is because polyunsaturated fats like omega-3 are susceptible to oxidation, um, they're also susceptible to light and oxygen. So oxidation from oxygen, light and oxygen, right? So anytime you have a see-through bottle, if you're buying a supplement at the grocery store and it's a see-through bottle, run away. Don't buy it. You're wasting your money because the likelihood that that product is going to be oxidized meaning rancid, you're going to get rancid fish oil, and you take rancid fish oil, not, number one, you're going to burp a ton of fish, and it's going to taste disgusting. And number two, you're eating oxidized fats, which will act like free radicals. So it's very, very important that you're not taking a supplement to improve your health, but actually taking a poor, inferior supplement that is oxidized, that is leading to, again, a free radical bombardment you know, when you're trying to help your body. So again, if you see a clear bottle, this is, this is why you'll see a lot, of, a lot of my products are in dark glass bottles. There's a reason for those, a lot of times those dark glass bottles are to keep out the light, right? And the tight seal around the lip is to keep out the oxygen, right? So it's to prevent that omega-3 from breaking down. One of the other things that you'll find in a good omega-3 fatty acid supplement is you'll find that it contains antioxidants in the formula. So there will typically there will be some type of antioxidant substance substance. That antioxidant is there to protect the fat from oxidation. Right? So again, polyunsaturated fats, omega-3 and omega-6 are the two types. Um, and, and again, most people will not supplement omega-6. It's a waste of money. If you're supplementing omega-6, stop unless it's a very specific kind. We'll get into that in a moment. Uh, but predominantly, if you're looking to supplement the, the diet in, in Western culture, it's this is what needs to be supplemented. And you want to make sure your, your bottles are either solid, with not allowing light in, or dark glass, not allowing light in, and sealed very well, but also contain other antioxidants. Some common antioxidants found in some fish oil products are things like rosemary or tocotrienols or alpha lipoic acid or um, vitamin E. These are just examples of antioxidants that are commonly added to omega-3 to protect them from deteriorating and oxidizing before you get to use them. So um, you've got omega-3 and you've got omega-6. And then we also have over here 
under monounsaturated as a type of uh, as a type of um, of omega fat because these are all three, six, and nine are all considered omega fats: omega three, omega six, and omega nine. And so, omega nine is generally not something you'll want to supplement with either. Again, we'll talk more in detail about the differences and the nuances between these different types of fats here in just a minute. So, there are different types or subtypes, if you will, when we're talking about omega-3, and we're talking about omega-6, there are subtypes of these fats. And so you, it's important that you understand to a certain extent, and we're not going to have a, you know, a test after the end of this crash course, but it's important to kind of understand what you're looking at. Again, if you're trying to supplement, if you're trying to figure out how to supplement or what to supplement with, knowing some of this knowledge is going to be very helpful. EPA DHA and ALA are the three types of omega-3, subtypes of omega-3 fat. Now, ALA generally is plant-based. Again, generally speaking, you know, things like chia flax um, provide ALA. And then you have EPA and DHA, which your body can convert ALA into EPA. Um, but predominantly, EPA comes from fatty fish. You can get, you know, you can get some omega-3 as well from grass-fed beef. Um, and again, same thing here, DHA, predominantly fatty fish. We'll talk about other dietary sources shortly, but uh, again, you've, you've got to eat these things. And so I, I've seen that cases where a lot of times where people hate fish, where they're allergic to fish, and so they avoid it like the plague, and they're really struggling to get adequate quantities of omega-3. And we'll talk about some of the symptoms that those people experience here in just a minute. And then we have omega-6. Uh, and there's two primary forms of omega-6, linoleic acid, or LA, here, and then gamma linoleic acid here. Um, and so we'll talk more, again, about those in just a minute. But, but uh, most of your omega-6s are, are derived from... Uh, in the American diet anyway, are derived from plant-based sources. So some of the key functions of omega fats. So we know omega-3 fatty acids as an example support cardiovascular health, and this, a lot of this is through regulation and modulation of inflammation. And so they protect us from overproducing inflammation. Um, we also know that these fats have an effect on blood thickness or blood viscosity. So it's important to understand that. We'll talk more about why in just a minute. So support healthy brain function and cognition. A lot of your, your, um, your, your brain tissue, especially in the developing fetus, um, you know, developing fetus need a lot more omega-3 for that developing neurological system for the brain, the spinal cord to properly develop. Uh, but cognitive function, and this in adults, healthy brain function and cognition, maintaining a healthy inflammatory response, and then, um, and, and there, again, there are other functions for it. There's some research studies that show that it's very, very beneficial in a number of key types of conditions, like uh, people that struggle with cardiovascular issues like high triglycerides. Uh, and there's even some research talking about omega-3's effect on LDL, which is LDL, low-density lipoprotein, which is a form of cholesterol. And although I'm not a big fan of, of demonizing cholesterol like many doctors are, um, you know, some people ask me, what's a natural way to lower the cholesterol? This is one of the best ways in the world right here to, to support healthy cholesterol levels is omega-3 fatty acids. As, as a matter of fact, it's one of the few things known to man that can lower your LDL and lower your triglycerides simultaneously. So very, very effective in that way. Some key functions of omega-6. Now, a lot of times, just like when people talk about cholesterol, they talk about good and bad. Even though there's no such thing as good or bad, they're all important. Your body won't make something or won't need something essentially if it's bad. It, it needs it. So it's not necessarily about good or bad. But a lot of people look at omega-3 fats as good. And so, again, I, I, I want to break that spell of thinking it in that way. And they look at omega-6 as bad. And so although this isn't technically, this isn't true, it's the ratio at, at which you uh, achieve levels in your body. So if you, where most people are in the United States is their levels of omega-6 are too high and their levels of omega-3 are too low. It's not that one is good or bad, it's that there's this massive imbalance or shift in the wrong direction that leads to bad things. So keep that in mind. 
Now, omega-6 are important for a lot of things. They provide energy. They help stimulate the skin and hair growth. Uh, so hair loss being one of, the, one of the symptoms of deficiency. They maintain bone health. They regulate your overall metabolic function and metabolism. They're very, very important, specifically speaking, for, uh, for thyroid hormone. So again, how bad could they be when they help your thyroid hormone um, and your metabolism? Uh, and then they maintain the reproductive system. So the reproductive system in, in females meaning helps to help with fertility. Um, it's very hard for a female to become pregnant when they're low or deficient in omega fatty acids. And then we have omega-9. This actually should be a 9 right here. Omega-9 fatty acids. Um, there's research that shows that omega-9s help with insulin sensitivity, aid in the permeability of cell membranes, and then help maintain brain and nerve health. Now, I, I want to talk in a little bit more depth about what this second one means in the aid of uh, aiding in the permeability of cell membranes. So uh, let's draw a picture here. Okay, so this is uh, obviously it's a cell. This is the outer membrane. And these are sometimes referred to as, if you ever took biology in school, as a phospholipid membrane. Okay, and if we were to blow up a picture of what that looks like, it would kind of look like And if you get out an old biology textbook, you'll see something that looks kind of like this. So if we were to take like a cross section of this wall and blow it up and expand it out, it would look something like this. And so um, kind of the, the, the way this works is, is this membrane separates the outside of the cell from the inside of the cell. But this membrane has within it a number of different receptors that are embedded and channels that are embedded within it. And this is how things from the outside can get into the inside. And so what happens if you don't have enough omega-9, so again, we're talking about omega-9 uh, fatty acids. Um, one of the primary forms of omega-9 is, is something called oleic acid, oleic acid. Um, and so if you don't have enough, then the cell membrane, which is semi-permeable, I'm, I'm gonna give you a visual example, if you ever, uh, if, you, if, you, if you've ever done the experiment where you poured oil and water into the same cup, and ultimately what happens is the oil floats at the surface, the water floats below. And that's because um, water and oil don't mix, right? We've all, we've all heard that kind of cliche saying, and, that, and it's true inside your cells, and that, that's why this fatty membrane separates the inside water from the outside water. But again, there are all kinds of receptors, like there's hormone receptors, embedded in your membrane. There's channels and pores embedded in this membrane. And what happens, kind of the way this might, the way this might look, is imagine, let's just, let's just alter our drawing a little bit here. Um, imagine there's a receptor embedded in this membrane and it kind of sits and it has like a, a receptor structure and it kind of moves through the membrane so that what happens is if a chemical comes into contact with that receptor, it can send a message through the membrane inside the cell. And generally that message, it comes inside the cell and it communicates to the DNA. And that's how your cells know what to do. So that a lot of your, your membrane has different, again, different receptors that are embedded within it. And, and they serve in this function to allow things in or out of the cell and have a proper check and balance. So if you're low in oleic acid, this membrane, so going back to that example, when you, when you pour water and oil into a cup together, you get, uh, you get a, a, a semi-permeable layer of liquidous fat on top as you get water on the bottom. So imagine when you, when you pour like a vegetable oil in that cup of water, that, that vegetable oil is for the most part, it's, um, it's, it's not fully saturated, so it's an unsaturated oil, much like oleic acid, which is a monounsaturated fat. What that, what that means to you is at room temperature, the oil is a liquid. 
if, if, you were to, if you were to take the temperature and drop the temperature down, we might see that that fat turns more into a hard substance, much like you see with animal fats. When at higher temperatures, they turn into a liquid. You can make a gravy with them, but at lower temperatures, um, they actually start to solidify, and you see that white fat. That's because they're more saturated. But what happens when you're low in oleic acid is this membrane becomes more like a saturated fat, meaning it, it actually can become more rigid and more stiff, right? So the permeability of this membrane becomes affected. So things can't get inside the cell as well, and waste can't get outside the cell. So if some of the waste gets trapped, and so you get toxicity intracellularly with lack of things being able to come in and communicate with the cell. So lack of oleic acid causes this membrane to be more like, imagine Crisco. If you were a kid and you ever saw that hardened vegetable oil, that, that solid trans fat, imagine your cell membranes being more rigid and more hard and that not having that permeability. That's what happens when you have an oleic acid or omega-9 fatty acid deficiency. And so what this leads to symptomatically is it leads to a reduction, it reduces the, the function of hormones because a lot of these receptors embedded in your cell membrane are hormone receptors. So it, you could be making the perfect amount of hormones, but if the receptors can't get the message through the cell wall because it's too rigid, then you get a dampened hormone response. So it reduces the functionality of your hormones potentially, and that's not a good thing. So it's a very important fat, and we don't want to leave it out of our diets for that reason. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about omega-3. That was, Again, that was omega-9. Let's talk a little bit about omega-3. So alpha-linolenic acid, which is mostly derived from plant-based foods, um, is not technically um, the end product of EPA and DHA. Right? These big, um, fancy, long, complex words, docosa hexaenoic acid and icosa pentaenoic acid, why we abbreviate them EPA and DHA because they're a mouthful. But this is plant-based and this in and of itself to, to become largely beneficial has to be converted, okay, and that conversion predominantly occurs here. So we get, we get alpha linolenic acid which converts into EPA and it's done through this enzyme, right? So this conversion occurs through an enzyme that requires these nutrients, B3, vitamin B6, zinc, and magnesium. So um, a lot of people ask, well, okay, I, I actually have already seen this question in the feed. I'm, a, I'm allergic to fish. Um, there are plant-based sources of alpha-linolenic acid, um, but if you don't have enough B3, B6, zinc, or magnesium in your diet, then you can block the conversion of ALA to EPA. And remember, EPA has very important functions. And so it's important, again, to understand there's a biochemistry that occurs. There's a conversion that occurs. It's not just about, you know, eating plant-based sources of ALA and wishing for the best. Sometimes in, in people that are very sick who have malnutrition, and we see this a lot with people with gluten sensitivity, magnesium, zinc, and B vitamin deficiencies um, can lead to a reduction in the ability to actually generate or make EPA from alpha-linolenic acid, again, which is the plant-based source of omega-3. The other thing that's important to know is that this enzyme is blocked by alcohol. So if you're a heavy drinker, uh, even that one glass of wine a night, right? And I see this a lot. I've seen get this a lot actually in vegetarians. It's not that people can't be vegetarian and it be a safe diet, but if you're a vegetarian and you're drinking alcohol on a daily basis, you're going to have a harder time getting adequate EPA, and this is going to potentially lead to increased risk for heart disease. And I, most vegeta vegetarians I talk to uh, one of the biggest reasons we hear people go vegetarian is, to, is their doctor told them they wanted them to reduce their risk of heart disease. But again, they also tell them to drink that glass of red wine every night. And so you're now inhibiting the enzyme that helps you get here, and that, that is going to increase your risk for heart disease. We also know that trans, fat, uh, trans fats it will block this enzyme from working. So that's your, your, you know, your hydrogenated fats. Um, predominantly, you know, we're not using those or seeing those being used as much today as we were 10 years ago, but these are the oils, the hydrogenated vegetable oils, the shortening, the Crisco, things of that nature that are commonly used in baking. Um, so these types of fats, again, they inhibit 
this enzyme from doing its job to convert into EPA. We know that protein deficiency can, can restrict this conversion, and we know that steroids, so if you're taking like glucocorticoids, um, that would be like cortisol, right? So if you're, if you're on a glucocorticoid or steroid, like an asthma inhaler, or if you're taking steroids for chronic pain, or taking steroids for an autoimmune um, arthritis condition, like these, these steroids will block, again, the conversion of ALA into EPA. And that's, that's an important uh, thing to recognize because you need this, right? This is essential, especially if you're not eating animal products because the only other major source of EPA really comes from uh, animal products, right? It comes predominantly from cold water fish. And we know that EPA is super critical. Why? Because it regulates inflammation. Um, we know DHA is super important because it, it, it's, it's, we call it oftentimes, we refer to it as brain fat, right? It's very important for the brain development, especially of growing babies. It's also important for the brain health in adults. And uh, there are linkages to DHA deficits and, um, and Alzheimer's and onset of dementia. But this also, this fat here also regulates inflammation. So they both help in this process. It's just this one a little bit more focused in the brain, this one a little bit more focused systemically. So omega-3, uh, EPA, DHA, very, very important. Now here's uh, a little bit about omega-6. Again, I, I mentioned earlier, a lot of people refer to omega-6 as bad, but I, I don't want you to think of them as bad. I want you to think of the source of where you're getting them from and, how, and the quantity of how much you're getting in compared to the quantity of omega-3 because it's about ratios. But these are very important fats too. Now what generally, you get linoleic acid from grains, which I don't recommend, especially in those that are gluten sensitive. Grains and nuts uh, are some of the predominant sources of linoleic acid, grains, nuts, and seeds. And, and most of where Americans get this and, and even other folks in industrialized countries are from processed seed oils. So like if, if you're eating out at a restaurant where they're using you know, processed seed oils like corn oil, um, soy oil, canola oil, these are some of your major ones. This is what, one of the reasons why omega-6 is so high in the standard, uh, in the standard industrialized diet. It's, it's way over represented. It's also blocked. It's, so linoleic acid comes in through those things and then it has to be converted into this very helpful type of omega-6 called gamma linoleic acid. And gamma helps also, just like the omega-3s, helps to regulate inflammation. And this is actually very, very helpful. Uh, women, ladies, it's very, very helpful if you have premenstrual symptoms, you know, ag aggressive cramping and pain around your cycle. This type of fat can be very, very effective and very, very helpful at modulating that because of its effect, um, because of its effect in, in the production of, of prostaglandins. And so regulating inflammation. So again, same thing here, we have this enzyme that's used to convert linoleic acid into gamma linoleic acid, and it requires the same level and the same nutrients that we saw with omega-3. It's also blocked by trans fat, it's blocked by alcohol. Um, and so, you know, in order to get this to convert properly, and so what happens for a lot of people is they're malnourished, they have diets that are high in trans fat, they have diets that are too high in linoleic acid, and so what ends up happening is this whole enzymatic system gets bogged down. They never make it here to any level of efficiency. And so they don't have the ability to regulate inflammation as well. And so then they're chronically inflamed. Remember when I use the word regulate inflammation, a lot of people want to use the word anti-inflammatory. What's the difference between regulating inflammation and being anti-inflammatory? And anti-inflammatory is something that generally will tend to block inflammation. And I think it's important to differentiate what I mean. Uh, so there's anti, and then there's regulatory, so something that regulates. So understand that inflammation is a normal bodily process. And just like omega-3 and omega-6, neither one are bad. It's about how much you eat and it's about ratios. Inflammation is not bad either, although it oftentimes gets a bad rap. Because we always hear, we hear, especially in the functional realm, a lot of doctors say, Inflammation is the root cause of all chronic degenerative disease and autoimmune disease and health problems. It's, it's, it, and that is true, but it's also false. And that it's not inflammation, right? It's, it's when inflammation is unchecked, right? So it's unfettered or unchecked 
high levels of inflammation that is what leads to the problem. Because what is inflammation actually designed to do? What does the body need inflammation to do? The body uses inflammation to tear down old and damaged tissue so that you have room to rebuild and replace it with new, um, new tissue, right? So, for, for example, your gut cells, every two to seven days, have to be replaced. Well, how do we get rid of the old ones? We use inflammation. We use controlled forest fires, in a sense, controlled fires to get rid of the old and damaged cells and to replace them with new cells. So you need a controlled level of inflammation. And this is, when I say regulating inflammation, this is controlled. This is controlled and intentional and on purpose. And we need things that can regulate that inflammatory process. Okay, again, very, very different than, um, than, than using the term anti-inflammatory. Because anti-inflammatory typically means that it blocks the, the chemical process of inflammation. And so where, where this term really is largely used, anti-inflammatory, is in, is in pharmaceutical, right? So pharma produces a lot of, there are a lot of different drugs that, that actually block the chemical process of creating inflammation. And why is it a bad idea? It's a great idea in the short term if you've got somebody in such acute pain that they can't, you know, they can't function. And, 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 but where it gets, becomes a problem is understand that inflammation is part of the healing cycle. It's part of the healing process. And if you don't go through it and allow it to happen appropriately, you actually impede healing. You don't, just because you feel better doesn't mean you're healing better. And that's an important thing to understand because the chemicals that, that are made, so, so inside of your cell membranes, you have omega-3, omega-6, omega-9 fat, okay, inside of your cell membrane. So, so going back to what I showed you a minute ago, in this membrane, you have these types of fats. You also have an enzyme uh, uh, called COX, cyclooxygenase. If you've ever heard of a COX inhibitor, these are drugs like Vioxx and Celebrex. Vioxx was pulled from the market uh, it, it was an anti-inflammatory COX inhibitor that was causing heart attacks, it, and it killed thousands of people before they, they actually fined the company, which by the way is Pfizer. They were fined, I think it was $2.8 billion for lying about their research, for hiding the fact that they knew that that, that particular drug was detrimental. It's the same company, by the way, that's making those shots that everybody's running to get. It's the same company. Um, that paid the largest fine in, in, in American history for, for lying and murdering and damaging. It was a criminal penalty fine. Anyway, aside from all that, you've got COX enzymes that, that act on these fats. So, so cyclooxygenase is an enzyme that acts on these fats and produces these very important in-stream chemicals called prostaglandins and leukotrienes. And these chemicals regulate the inflammation and balance the inflammation process in such a way that your body is able to get rid of the old so that it can bring in the new. And so again, when you block that enzyme, and guess what else blocks that enzyme? Ibuprofen blocks that enzyme. Your, your predominantly, your non anti-inflammatories block that enzyme from doing its job, and that's why they actually stop pain. They stop pain because you never get to inflammation. But remember, you need inflammation to heal and repair, and, to, and, and at the end of the day, if you block it incessantly, which is the case for many people who take you know, over-the-counter non anti-inflammatories every day to block their pain, then what you're actually ending up doing is you're, you're inhibiting your body's full capacity to heal. It's a bad idea. Now, let's talk about the optimal omega ratio. So the typical diet today is 16 to 1. And this is, what are, what are we referring to? We're talking about omega 6, 3 ratio. So this is, this would refer to omega 6, the 16, and then the one would refer to omega-3, okay? So the most diets today, for, for you know, pound for pound, right, you get 16 to every one omega-3. And this right here, it's this balance that leads to a heightened inflammation. Your body makes more inflammation than what is necessary to do the daily maintenance. And so everything, everything is becoming... Uh, a struggle. And let me give you another analogy. So when you have this ratio, imagine, imagine you're, you're, you're tearing down old homes in a neighborhood because they're, they're full of termites and, and they're full of mold and these homes are unlivable, right? And they have to go so that you can build new homes. Okay, think of homes as you, we think of your cells. You've got old cells, they need to go. Um, generally, you would use 
to tear down old homes, you would use something uh, uh, like a bulldozer, right? You'd use a tool like a bulldozer. And that would be the appropriate tool to tear down an old home, okay? And, and in your body, you would use a tool like a balance of omega-6 to omega-3. So the balance of 6 to 3 is akin to like using a bulldozer, right? But instead of using a bulldozer, now imagine that you're using a 20-ton bomb. And that bomb, that, that huge bomb like that, is not just going to blow up the house that you're trying to tear down, but it's going to blow up the whole neighborhood around it. And so you're going to have this big mess, and maybe the whole neighborhood didn't need to be blown up. Maybe it was just the one house. My point is... You use the right tool to do the right job, and when your ratios are 16 to 1, it's like using a 20-ton bomb to replace an old cell. And what happens is not just that one cell that gets, that gets damaged and taken back. It's lots of exaggerated damage that occurs. And so now your body is using more inflammation than what's necessary to break down the old to replace it with the new. So it's breaking down the new as it's breaking down the old and creating more work and more repair. And this is where inflammation becomes chronic. This is where inflammation levels go up and they become very, very chronic and hard to manage. So if you're following kind of a standard American diet, 16 to 1, and in some cases I see it much higher. Like in a lot of the people that I see that come to me, we'll, we'll see 20 to 1. We'll see 25 and 30 to 1 ratios of omega-3s and 6s. The target is 4 to 1. Most researchers agree 4 to 1 is a, is a much better place to have, a, again, taking the analogy into consideration, a bulldozer-like effect. I preferentially, have, with people that are struggling with chronic illness, I actually look at 2 to 1 or 1 to 1, if we can achieve it, as being more ideal. And that's because when, when somebody's already got fires burning out of control, we, re we really want to get it dialed back. Now, <clears throat> this one-to-one -one ratio actually has historical significance, and this is actually where, if you've ever heard of the paleo diet or followed a paleo diet, a paleo diet, as a general rule of thumb, a true paleo diet is about a one-to-one -one ratio. So, you know, there's, there's historical significance here in this, and that we as humans today are not all that far removed from, uh, you know, his historically timeline speaking, from Paleolithic ancestry. And so some argue that this one-to-one -one is actually more ideal because we haven't had enough time in society to evolve to a bigger ratio. But I've seen it possible at two-to-one ratios, and I've seen perfectly healthy people with four-to-one ratios as well. But we certainly, this is, this is, think of this as the ideal, no higher than this. And you definitely don't want to be here because this is, this is where you're going to get a heightened inflammatory response. So. Let's talk about some of the symptoms, uh, and, and this is not an exhaustive list, but this is some of the more common kind of clinical manifestation that we see. One is skin issues, so like recurring skin rashes, and this can look like eczema. So if you've ever been diagnosed with eczema, you, you might consider asking your doctor to test your omega-3 fatty acid ratios in your, in your red blood cell membranes. Um, it's a simple test. It's a simple blood test. It can help you understand whether or not you have a deficiency. But again, skin issues, particularly eczema, a very common manifestation of omega-3 fatty acid deficiency. Another one can be depression, especially this one's particularly with DHA. So again, we said there, there were, this is omega-3, not just omega fatty acids, this is omega-3 specifically, not omega-6. But DHA, this is more has to do with EPA. Right Again, these are the two different subtypes of omega-3 fatty acids. And then dry eyes and, and vision distortion and vision problems. And this is, again, where we see a lot of DHA issues. Uh, in, my, in my experience, um, generally when somebody is deficient in omega-3, they're deficient in both. It's not like one is great and the other one's, the other one's terrible. They're generally deficient in both, although I'll sometimes see cases where people are supplementing with, a high, with, a, with an omega-3 fatty acid supplement that's high in DHA, DHA, but very low in EPA, and they just don't know enough about the supplement to understand that they're creating uh, good levels here, but not really addressing levels here. So when you're, again, going back to supplementation, you always want to look that supplement contains both. Um, both EPA and DHA, not just one or the other. You need them both. So these are some pretty common signs of deficiency. Um, there's some research, in, especially in infants, 
that, that, uh, that suggest that low levels of EPA, DHA, or more specifically even um, focused on DHA, contribute to poor IQ or, or um, learning or cognitive disabilities as kids evolve as their minds and brains mature. Um, so there's also research that shows that um, omega-3 EA or EPA specifically is very, very important for regulation of, of cardiovascular risk factors like triglycerides. I mentioned earlier that people with high triglycerides are oftentimes deficient in EPA, and that's, that can be a cause of high triglycerides. We also see, um, again, uh, super high levels of LDL develop as a result of um, EPA deficiency. So again, sometimes these, and this is even um, true, and some cardiologists will actually prescribe, uh, they'll give RX prescription omega-3. Um, they've actually, uh, some pharmaceutical companies have latched onto this and have actually created um, pharmaceuticals that are designed to help um, with cardiovascular risk by elevating uh, omega-3. The problem that I have seen with some of the pharmaceutical brands is they're full of dyes and other fillers. So the, the, the quality uh, and the attention to detail in the products, in my opinion, is poor, as it is with many drugs that contain fillers that are unhealthy for us. So a lot of drugs contain fillers. Let's talk about some gluten grain-free food sources of omega-3. So predominantly omega-3, think cold water fish, right, as I've, I've been saying uh, for a while now. Salmon, sardines, mackerel, anchovy, uh, cod, halibut, all good sources. Algae is a plant-based source. Flaxseed, walnuts, chia seeds, some leafy greens as well, um, but not substantially so, which is why it didn't make the main list. Um, you're not going to get enough from leafy greens to, to really hit the need that a person's going to have. So these are your primary sources. And how many of you, raise your hand, how many of you love these foods? I mean, it's very rare to see people uh, in today's society really gravitate toward eating fish. You know, a couple pounds of fish a week is about what it would take to get you really solid levels. And most people don't even come anywhere near that. Um, so then you're left to these devices, the walnuts, um, the chia seed, the flax seed. But many people going gluten-free struggle with seeds. That's why if, if you are following no grain, no pain, um, you know, that, that struggle is that seeds are hard to digest. And when you're already, your gut's already damaged by years of gluten exposure and damage, um, throwing in a bunch of seeds into the diet will sometimes delay or hinder a person's progress because the gut's already broken and you're asking it to digest things that are hard to digest. And so these are not always the greatest sources either. So fatty fish is our predominant source. Now you can get some omega-3 as well from grass-fed beef, but the, the issue here is it needs to be grass-fed, grass-finished, because what a lot of farms have done is they call it grass-fed beef, but then they finish it out on grain. And when, you know, understand that when you, when you feed a cow, when you feed an animal tons of grain, what does that do to the flesh of the animal? Well, it converts the type of fat in the animal's flesh into omega-6. So if, if you're eating grass-fed, grain-finished, you're going to get more omega-6 from that beef. If you're eating grass-fed, grass-finished, you're going to get more omega-3 from that beef. So it's an important delineation to make because if you're not asking that question, I've seen cases where they just call it grass-fed beef, but they don't... They don't delineate whether it was grass finished. Well, grass fed just means I fed my cow some grass. There's no like legal requirement on a label for, for a farmer to say, to, to differentiate. So you, you've got to know the source of your food and you've got to ask the company or the manufacturer what, what you're actually getting there. It's very important delineation. And then we have omega-6. And I said earlier, um, and these are, these are what we would generally consider to be relatively healthy sources of omega-6, but most omega-6 in the American diet comes from grains. All grains contain high quantities of omega-6. Remember, in the U.S., 50% um, calorically, 50% of calories in the U.S. diet comes from wheat which is horrific, right? Which is just going to, it's an omega-6 bomb. And that's why omega-6 oftentimes referred to as bad, be, because it's such an imbalance. There's so much 
grain in the diet driving up omega-6 to such a great degree that you don't get the regulatory um, process of, of regulating inflammation properly. You get this huge imbalance and so you get heightened inflammation as a result of that. Some of these are, are healthier versions or healthier sources of omega-6. But you know, one thing I would also add we could put in here is chicken or other poultry. And the reason why, unlike beef, beef, you know, ruminant animals are not designed to, um, to process or digest grains. Like their, their guts are not designed for grain as a staple food. They're more designed for grazing of grasses, but not necessarily the seeds in mass quantities. And so what happens on these commercial farms is you lock all these animals in tight quarters and the only thing they get to eat is grain. They don't get any natural grasses or clovers or other, you know, other greens and that's what they need to be healthy. Um, chickens, on the other hand, can eat grain. Ruminant animals, not so much. They're not quite designed for it, but chickens are. They're designed for seeds. They're designed to be able to handle that. But the problem with chicken today is when you buy chicken, you know, you want to look for the term free range. And ideal, I, I recommend when you buy your meats, I recommend if you don't have a great local farmer's market where you can talk to the farmer directly, there are certain companies that I do recommend. You can find those, those recommendations on glutenfreesociety.org. Under, um, under the shop tab, there's a, there's a section called food resources, and you can find those different companies that we do recommend there. We'll put a link to that. But you want a true free range. So what free range means in the, in the industry is that they're all inside and the door's open. That's not free range. You want chickens actually grazing on pasture, grazing and eating bugs and insects and picking at worms. Um, because the chicken diet should also not be predominantly just grain. But chickens can eat grain. And, and, it, and again, a lot of people get scared. They think, oh, if I, if I eat chicken, then I'm going to get glutened. No, the, the gluten won't show up in the meat of a chicken or the egg of a chicken. And chickens are capable of eating and processing grain, but they should be true free range so their diet is more diverse. Because how, how you get, really how you get good solid, you can get omega-6 and omega-3 from, from, from chicken if they're truly free range. But where people run into trouble with chicken is when they're not free range and they're just grain fed. This is where, just like with the beef, you're going to get a lot of omega-6 in that meat. It's going to drive up your omega-6, and if you're not getting adequate omega-3, that ratio that's, you know, that ratio that we don't want to see happen, which is that 16 to 1, really anything higher than 4 to 1, is going to lead to a, a challenge with regulating the inflammatory process. So just, again, when you're checking your meats, check for, you know, again, organic free range, because it's the other thing. Organic, because if they are eating grains, if the farmers are feeding them some grains, in their feed, you want to make sure they're not getting pesticide in that grain. So you don't want glyphosate in your meat. You don't want glyphosate in your eggs. So again, it's important that you look for organic free range, but we could add chicken to this list as well. And then omega-9s, we talked about earlier, um, olive oil, olives, avocados, olive oil, almonds, sesame uh, oil, pistachios, cashews, hazelnuts, and macadamia nuts. So a lot of different ways we can get omega-9s in the diet. And remember, I, I, I took time earlier to draw out how omega-9 regulates the permeability of the cell, of that phospholipid bilayer of your cell. So very, very important for hormonal messaging. This is a very common deficiency I see when we test people. Um, most people I see are deficient in omega-3. I'd venture to say of all new people that come to me in my, in, in my clinic, I'd say probably 90% coming in from the get-go are omega-3 deficient. Uh, and I'd say probably 30% are omega-9 deficient. And so these are, these are quite common to see out there. And it's very easy through diet to achieve adequate levels. But again, um, you know, if, you're, if you're telling yourself, I hate fish, it's going to be a real tough challenge to get enough omega-3 in. And this is really where supplementation is recommended in a big way. Okay, let's take some questions. Let's see here. So Dennis says, oh, Hi, Dr. Osborne. I take 3,000 milligrams of DHA and 1,000 milligrams of EPA daily for cognitive health. Is that a good dose? Yeah, it's not too bad. You're at four grams total. I would balance that out a little bit more. You're a little high on DHA and a little low on EPA, Dennis. So I would look more for closer to one-to-one. 
uh, even if it's not perfectly one to one, you're at you're at one to three EPA um, to DHA, and I would look to kind of get it closer to to an equilibrium between the two. Um, um, opinions on cod liver and krill oil. So cod liver oil does contain omega-3, DHA, and EPA. But one of the problems with persistently using cod liver oils is super high in vitamin A. And, um, in the, in, in not beta carotene, but actually vitamin A. And so what can happen is that can stress um, your vitamin D levels, creating a problem there. I also see a lot of people on cod liver oil, um, and, and there are some companies that do this fermented cod liver oil stuff, and that stuff is oxidized and rancid, and it's terrible for you. Don't do that. Um, but, but I also see with a lot of cod liver oils where people are getting enough DHA, but they're getting enough, so it's, it's okay. But the EPA in the cod liver oil, I, you know, it's down. I'll give it a frowny face because I see just so, see so many people using cod liver oil as, as their supplement. And it's very rare that we see their EPA come back at high enough levels. So in, in my experience, the DHA comes back okay with cod liver oil, but EPA not. And so you get that imbalance. So, and again, the vitamin A is something else you have to worry about as well. Um, as far as krill oil, krill oil is a good source of DHA. So again, if you're trying to take, some people try to take krill oil to get enough EPA DHA, and the problem again with krill oil is going to be right here, not enough EPA. You'll get, you'll get good DHA, but not enough EPA. Um, Marie says, hi from the hospital bed. Marie, wishing you um, an expedient recover. My prayers are coming your way. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in from the hospital. Uh, I like this comment. Tom says, Tom and Lisa, love your Omega Max supplement. Lab results prove that they're doing their job and bonus, no nasty fishy aftertaste. So uh, forgive me for the shameless plug, but um, I didn't say it. Tom and Lisa did. Thanks for, for chiming in, Tom and Lisa. Opinion of the one meal a day fasting. Um, you know, I, some people do really well with it and some people do very poorly with it. I don't, I don't think that OMAD as a principle is something that everyone is... is is shaped up to do or that everyone should do. I think that intermittent fasting is something everyone can achieve to a certain level. Um, and, and a great place to start with, with that would be a 16-8 style or 16-8 strategy. And if you don't know what I'm talking about or don't know much about intermittent fasting, go back and watch my show on intermittent fasting. Uh, we just don't, we don't have time to get into the depths of that today. How much of my daily requirement of omega-3 can I get from each egg? Depends on the egg that you're eating. Um, some farmers feed their chicken flax and chia, which will increase the omega-3 levels of eggs to a certain extent. Um, but as a general rule of thumb, you know, I, I don't, you're not going to get a heck of a lot of EPA or DHA from eggs. Most of that is going to be the linolenic acid. So again, there's that conversion that has to happen to activate into EPA and DHA. Um, so egg would not be the source of food I would select in, in an attempt to, to, you know, not that you can't eat eggs, not that eggs aren't healthy, not that eggs can't be a source of, you know, of, uh, of, ALA, of ALA, but I just, you know, you're not going to get much EPA or DHA from it. I take fish oil that has 2,400 fish oil with EPA of 360 and, and uh, DHA of 240. So if you're taking 2,400 and there's only 360 and 240, you're getting ripped off. Um, because the other, you know, that 360 and 240 is only equal to 600 of that 2400. So what is the other 1800 that you're getting? I would surmise if I were guessing that you're getting a lot of omega-6, maybe some omega-9, and you don't need that. You get enough of that from your diet. Again, when you're looking at supplementation, you don't need to supplement with six and nine. They're, they're so ubiquitous in the diet today Supplementing with them is a complete waste of money and bang for buck what you really want to focus on is EPA and DHA So good omega-3 with EPA and DHA. I Think I answered the question about fermented cod liver oil. It's junk and it's oxidized stay away from it I've seen more people come in um, with problems as a result of taking that. I don't know how they Ethically produce that and say it's good for people um, 
Is it true that omega-3 fats can prevent the onset of psychosis? It just depends on what the psychosis is and why the psychosis is there. It's, it's true that many people that experience psychosis can have EPA or DHA deficiency leading to progression, but um, I wouldn't call it a cure-all for that. Again, everybody's psychosis um, cause, if you will, is, is, is subject to their own uniqueness. So Mary's asking, if I already take magnesium uh, 7 supplement and calm magnesium before bed, what would your Omega product add to help me sleep better? Looking to increase my REM and deep sleep. Any ideas on products? I mean, if you're looking to increase your, your REM sleep, magnesium 3 and 8 is, you know, I don't know what, you, when you say magnesium 7, I, I don't know specifically if that's a brand name or what you really mean. And calm magnesium is probably not magnesium 3 and 8, if I had to guess. Again, without looking at your labels, hard for me to chime in and be 100% accurate there. But uh, magnesium 3 and 8. Magnesium 3 and 8 passes the blood-brain barrier. And it's in, a lot of research has been done on that particular form of magnesium as it's bound to 3 and 8 can get by, by the BBB blood-brain barrier and, um, and help induce better quality sleep. But one of the other big factors is just sleep hygiene. So many people ignore sleep hygiene and try to take supplements to help them with their sleep. But sleep hygiene is important. Turn off your, your wireless, your Wi-Fi, um, you, you know, no major blue lights before bedtime. Consider prayer meditation uh, or journaling before bedtime. Like, like gear down from your day to go to sleep and clear your mind before you go to sleep. And also sunshine. Sunshine is a huge factor. Uh, in, in increasing your REM sleep through the production, the adequate production of melatonin that keeps you in a deeper sleep for longer when you go to bed. A lot of people are sunshine deficient, especially if you live north of 27 degrees latitude. Uh, let's see here. Let's go down on the left side a little bit. Let's see. Yeah, so somebody mentioned a brand and, and on our YouTube space, and, and, I, and I'm not going to say the name. You can go in and you can read the comments, but um, Robert mentioned a brand of fish oil that he takes. And I'll just say this about that particular brand. That brand is horrific. Um, it's junk. We've actually independently tested some of it. Uh, a lot of times it doesn't even contain what it's supposed to contain. Um, but, you know, their, their logo is number one pharmacist recommended. Well, how many pharmacists study nutrition? Pharmacists study pharmacology of, of, of drugs. And they have no expertise really in the realm of nutrition unless they sought out additional expertise. So saying number one pharmacist recommended is like, is like having a product for an electrician that says number one plumber's recommended product uh, for an electrical product. Like it's the wrong group to get to back your product. And of course, pharmacists are gonna recommend it because they don't know anything about it and they're just getting paid, uh, paid for that recommendation. Um, should someone at higher risk of Alzheimer's with family history need more omega-3 and or phospholipids than others do? I've read APOE4 carriers don't process the fats as well and may need more to have the same protective effects. I, I would say that's a great question, Donna. Possibly yes. I mean. It, I don't look at APOE4 as a guarantee in that regard. I've seen cases of people with APOE4, they're doing fantastic. So I don't look at that as a predetermining, um, uh, like predestination toward Alzheimer's, but my advice would be measure it. It's super easy to measure. Um, it's, it's a fatty acid uh, membrane test that can be measured through a blood draw where, where you can determine how much a person is getting in their diet. And once you know that, you know what the baseline is and you can be better guided as to um, how to manipulate the diet in a better direction or if supplementation is something that that person wants to consider, they can do that too. Should we keep omega-3 in the fridge? You don't have to. Um, you can, but you don't have to. Um, you know, provided again, that uh, you don't buy a bottle and it lasts for a year or two years. Like a, a good bottle of omega-3 that's sealed, you know, has, you know, will stay fresh and will stay just fine because it's, it's packaged in the right type of packaging. Uh, it has antioxidants inside of it that help protect it from oxidation and, and, and you know, light damage. Uh, so you shouldn't need to keep it in the fridge. I, I find that when a lot of, with supplements, when, Lynn, when a lot of people put supplements in the fridge, 
the compliance of taking the supplement drops by about half because they forget it's in the fridge. All their other supplements are in a different location, and so oftentimes that one in the fridge gets left out. But a good quality omega-3 will not need refrigeration. Is grapeseed oil bad for me? You know, I don't. I wouldn't use grapeseed oil as a as a staple for food preparation. I, I do think it's a bad idea. It's one of those processed seed oils that's going to be rich in omega six. Um, how much should someone take if detoxifying toxins that are high in fat? You talking about omega threes? How much omega threes should someone take if they're detoxifying? Look, I think omega-3, the standard kind of really strong and really solid therapeutic dose just for a person, if just in good general health, taking two grams a day, but the two grams need to be predominantly 90% of the two grams should be EPA and DHA. And not a bunch of filler oil like omega-6 and omega-9 that's not necessary. And again, I see that all the time. It's because it's super cheap to put those other oils in and EPA and DHA are expensive. And so what a lot of manufacturers do is they, is they downplay the EPA and DHA and put a cheap product in there and then sell the product for a very expensive amount of money and that increases their profit margin. You really have to, you, you know, you have to understand that um, EPA and DHA is what you're looking for. So, so two grams a day, mostly 90% plus of it coming from the EPA DHA. And then, you know, we see fish oil, even the FDA says it's safe up to three grams a day with no known side effects or no known reported issues. But clinically speaking, I, I, I get cases sometimes where we go four, six, eight grams a day, depending on the situation, depending on the person. So again, that's, that's more of, I don't recommend that you go that on your own without actually having monitoring and testing, but um, the omegas are very safe, you know, even at higher doses. So I don't eat fish, however, have been on your Omega Max for six weeks. How long do I need to wait until repeating serum tests to compare results? Um, if, you're, you know, if you want to see a change in the, in the membrane, at least three to four months. Uh, these are red blood cells. So we want to give red blood cells have a life cycle of three to four months. So if you've been on that product for six weeks, take it out another six weeks or so and then have your levels checked. Is omega-9 good for Parkinson's? Omega-9 is no miracle cure for Parkinson's. It's good for people. I wouldn't say it's necessarily good for Parkinson's. It's just it's good for people to get enough omega-9. But again, most people will get enough through their diet. So I don't think supplementation, even with Parkinson's, is going to lead to, at least it hasn't in my clinical experience, ever led to any kind of massive improvements in Parkinsonian tremors or, or symptoms. Best way to test for omega-3 is, is in the phospho, is in the red blood cell membranes. So there's, there's testing that can measure the omega-3 levels and omega-6 levels and arachidonic acid levels in the membrane of red blood cells. Okay, let's see. Does grain, which causes pain, mean you are gluten sensitive? I mean, if you're eating grain and it's hurting you, you may be gluten sensitive, but you may also be reacting to other properties of the grain. So for, so for example, one of the negative properties to grain is gluten. Another negative property to grain are lectins. Another negative property are proteins called ATIs, amylase trypsin inhibitors. Other things about grain that, that drive in the inflammatory process is that they're high in omega-6, so they create an omega-6, omega-3 ratio that's higher to closer to that 16 to one, and that drives up the inflammatory response in the body. Um, grains contain heavy levels of molds and mycotoxins which can drive, uh, drive pain. So, I mean, there's, there's a number of elements around what's in grain beyond even gluten that can contribute to inflammatory pain. But, it, you know, if, if you find that when you eat grain and you react, I mean, if you really want to know, are you gluten sensitive, get genetically tested. Like, Mel, if you would, put, put a link up to genetic testing in there. Uh, because that's how you're going to know whether or not going gluten-free is the right thing to do or not. Um, and, whether, and, and whether or not it's gluten versus some other component of grain. Uh, how much omega-3 and 6? So, I mean, again, um, I think I answered that question. Two grams kind of as a base for omega-3. What, what we see is, is if you're eating a regular diet, even with some fish here and there, but you're taking two grams concentrated EPA, DHA, 
that's enough to keep your omega-3 fatty acid membrane levels in a very good place for prevention. Let's see here. So yeah, I like this question because it's a follow-up. So, so Helena, Helena is asking, I, remember, I seem to remember your book not recommending cashews or nuts. Can you remind us why? Yeah, absolutely. So it's cashew is not technically is not a nut. Cashew is a seed. And so the reason why, you know, people going through no grain, no pain, um, we, we generally in that, especially in that second phase, we have, have them avoid seeds for several reasons. One is because seeds are hard to digest. And again, people with gluten sensitivity issues that are trying to heal their gut don't want to put extra work on their gut. Uh, but number two is seeds are super high in omega-6. And so what we're trying to do in a person that's going grain-free is we're trying to rebalance their omega-6, omega-3 ratio. So in that, in that first in that first aspect of the protocol, we're avoiding seeds. Now, that being said, not everybody needs to avoid seeds forever. Again, the No Grain, No Pain diet was written as a generalization to people who don't come to see me in my practice and get tested so that they can understand what they need to do as a unique individual. So I've I created rules in No Grain, No Pain that anyone could follow without tests to help maximize their progress. So hopefully that helps you uh, understand the whys. Okay, so Danielle is asking, could you please put your gluten-free food source of omega foods on your site? It, it actually, Daniela, will be up there and you'll be able to print it out by the end of the week. So uh, if you subscribe to Gluten-Free Society, uh, that, that's actually one of the benefits of subscribing. So when we, when we have you know, mega resources for you that you'd like to bookmark or save, you get emails um, with links to those resources. And this is one that will be going out this week, later on this week. Okay, let's see. So somebody's asking, I've always been told the perfect ratio is three to one. Is this true? I, again, I like two to one. Uh, clinically speaking, and that's just my experience in helping people with inflammatory autoimmune problems, two to one is what we shoot for. Um, that's not to say three to one wouldn't be better than 16 to one. I think anything that's better than 16 to one is a, is a move in the right direction. Tracy says, I wish I liked sardines. Me too. My son, he can eat them like candy. He can eat oysters and sardines and all kinds of, see, you can eat octopus like candy. I just don't, it's not for me. I supplement personally with omega-3 because I'm not a huge fan of fish. Um, because where where I live, you don't you can't you really just can't get excellent cold water fish without it without it tasting too fishy. Jessica's asking if Parkinson's is caused by gluten. It can be. Um, Parkinson's has it's multifactorial. It's not a single uh, cause condition, but gluten can play a role in Parkinson's. I've seen some people with Parkinson's tremors improve. I've seen uh, a number of Parkinsonian cases and I've seen people improve with a gluten-free diet and I've seen some people not improve with a gluten-free diet. I've seen other reasons why Parkinson's occurs. You know, B vitamin deficiencies play a role. I've seen mold toxicity contribute to Parkinson's. I've seen other food sensitivities contribute to it. So uh, heavy metals contribute to it. So again, it's a multifactorial situation. The best way to get a thousand milligrams of EPA is to supplement, Melanie. I mean, if you don't, if you don't do well on anchovies, I, I mean, outside of that, other other cold water fish. But I, I would I would say supplementation. This is one of those times where you know in America we just don't. If you don't live in a coastal region, the fish doesn't taste well. If you don't live up north where you can get it really really fresh, a lot of it uh, by the time you get it, it you know, again, this is my my experience with it is it just doesn't taste all that great. Any of the omega oils good for psoriasis? Yeah, um, all of them, three, six, and nine are all necessary for healthy skin. But again, it's in the balance. It's in the right ratios. I like hearing that. Lin Linda says, I love your brand, Dr. Osborne. Other brands have caused a belching side effect. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we pride our brand on not really doing that. And part of the reason why is it's so fresh, like the way we package it and, and where, the way we source it. Um, 
you know, a lot of fish oil, the way they, the, the fish are caught and then they're shipped from uh, a port region to a factory. And, and so those fish, basically, they, they start to oxidize and that, that fat starts to turn, right, in those fish. And so not, not so with us. Our, we, where we produce our omega-3 is right there uh, on the coastal waters. Uh, and, and the, you know, where we generally try to source our omega-3 is, is the, the southern uh, the southern hemisphere, the super cold waters in the southern hemisphere, which are very, very clean waters and very, very um, clean fish. Uh, and then, you know, one of the other things, again, about omega-3 is you've got to be very careful about heavy metal contamination. And um, if you don't run the right testing and the right processes to distill and purify the oil from any type of metal contamination, then you, you run the risk of mercury exposure and other, and other toxic metals that are commonly polluting our oceans today. Do dried anchovies have omega-3s? Yes. Um, they do. Yes. Good question. Uh, let's see here. So chicken, especially factory farm, is very high in omega-6. Should we minimize chicken intake? You know, I, I would say don't necessarily minimize chicken intake. Just maximize solid, healthy chicken intake, right? Support a local farm. Um, you know, if you're in my area, we've got a great local farmer. He's actually, I, I went to school with him, um, and he, he turned into a farmer, right? That was his career change, and now he, he grows all of his own food and meat and sells it. Uh, it's a great farm. So if you're in the Houston area, you just call my office, and um, uh, you, know, you can get, get his information. Um, Harvest Hills Ranch is, is the name of his farm. It's a great, great company. Uh, does our organic virgin coconut oil have appropriate omegas? No. Uh, coconut oil is predominantly saturated fat, whereas omega oils, three sixes and nines, are unsaturated fats. And so again, that, the biggest difference is hydrogen bonds, uh, whereas coconut oil is more, more saturated in its bonding. So not the same thing, different kind of fat. So, you know, any idea why I get broken blood vessels in my eyes when I take more than one gram? There could be, there's a number of reasons, Terry. I, I would say, you know, one, look at the quality of the oil that you're taking. Um, I, you know, I can't, I, you know, I can't ex express that enough. Quality of the oil is very important because a lot of omega-3 over-the-counter products are garbage. They're junk. They're oxidized. You're poisoning yourself instead of helping yourself. Um, as far as, as, you know, as far as um, why else that, there's a lot of reasons why that may happen. Um, and there could be some other nutritional deficits that, that you need to address. Can taking omega-3 help to get you off stations? I, I would assume, Laura, you mean statins. Um, look, my, my opinion on statins is, is pretty clear. I don't recommend them. Um, I'm not a cardiologist and I'm not your doctor, so... Don't take my advice, uh, don't construe this as medical advice, but um, look, statins, we've been using statins since the early 1980s, and it's the number one prescribed drug in the United States. And since we've been using them, we haven't seen a reduced outcome in heart attacks and strokes and cardiovascular disease or heart disease. So if, if statins are so great, why haven't we seen a reduction of those illnesses? Why do we see those numbers climbing instead of reducing? It tells me empirically statins don't work. Um, and so, but a lot of doctors are dead set on statins because it's the standard of care. That you have to ask yourself whether, whether or not taking a pharmaceutical poison is it going to solve your health crisis and risk for cardiovascular disease, or do you need to make other meaningful changes in your diet that you're empowered to make um, beyond that statin. Remember, statins also block CoQ10, and CoQ10 deficiency causes congestive heart failure and high blood pressure. So if you're trying to reduce your risk of, of heart disease by causing CoQ10 deficiency and causing vitamin D deficiency with a drug designed to lower your cholesterol, and, and the cholesterol that statins predominantly work on is your LDL, which is considered bad cholesterol, but LDL isn't bad. LDL won a Nobel Prize. 1998, LDL was awarded the Nobel Prize because it was discovered that in order for you to make brain synapses, you need LDL, bad cholesterol, to make brain synapses. This is why so many people that take statins start to have uh, precognitive decline. So 
uh, you know, I don't want to get all too far off tangent here, but I, th I think you get my gist and my opinion on, on that particular type of medication. Is canned fish wild caught okay or bad? It's, it's okay. I, I think it's, a, it's definitely an option. Uh, is wild caught fresh better? Yeah, but I mean, if you live somewhere where you can't get access to it, I'm not 100% opposed to canned fish either. Um, there, there are some pros and cons to it, but I think overall um, it's a good source of protein, a good source of calcium, a good source of omegas, a good source of a number of different nutrients. Can your body not absorb omega supplementation, omega-3 supplementation? It, it, it can. Your body can absorb supplementation of omega-3 provided you have a functioning gallbladder and liver. Uh, if, you've, if you've got a, a poor functioning gallbladder and liver, then your body is going to struggle to to digest and absorb not just omega-3, but all fat. And so, but if, you're, if your body's digestion and absorption is relatively healthy, you should be just fine. Uh, do you ship your supplements to the UK? Helena, no, not at this point. We're working on an option. Um, be patient with us. We're trying to figure that out without making people pay an arm and a leg for shipping. Let's see here. Is veganism high in omega-6? Yes, it's extremely high in omega-6. Um, vegan diets are, and this is one of the problems. There have been some studies that have come out. I know that, I, I, I'll say this just very clearly. I'm not opposed to a vegetarian diet, and I'm not opposed to a heavy meat diet. I'm not opposed to either one. What I'm opposed to is the generalization that everyone should go plant-based or everyone should be on carnivore. I think I think you've got good fits on both sides of the equation, but there have been, you know, and I think if you're, if you're on one side, but you don't belong there genetically, then you need to get off that team. Uh, and so many people live and die almost like it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a dogmatic religious belief that only plant-based diets are the right thing because they've been, either they've been brainwashed or misinformed uh, about the actualities of nutrition, but there are a lot of studies that show vegans have poor quality of health, and, and there are a lot of studies that show that vegetarian diets improve certain cardiovascular and cancer risk factors. So, I mean, there's research on both sides of that equation, and I think the difference between the variable is biochemical individuality. Learn what is right for you. It's part of what we do in our clinic, is we teach people what's right for them based on accurate testing to help determine where they should go within their diet. But um, I, ho I hope that, that clears that up a little bit because I get, I get a lot of people, I, actually it happened this weekend, somebody was, you know, was, um, was talking about one of the recipes that we had posted and was talking about how it was made with meat and so therefore it completely disqualified it as being good and it was just a ridiculous statement to make. Um, anyway, you know, you, you've got to watch out for those types of dogmatic people who don't have the, the clarity of thought and the, and the um, let's just say they lack the, they lack the skill set to have a meaningful conversation because it doesn't matter what they hear from you, their mind is already made up. We see a lot of that in this past two years, right, where, where people have already made up their mind about masks, about social distancing, about whether or not to take the shot. I mean, They've made their mind up and they're not willing to listen or even watch reality as it unfolds, whether it proves them right or wrong. They're, they're, they're dogmatically stuck in a belief system. So you've got to be open to engaging and having a meaningful conversation. Yeah, I, liked, I, I don't like that that happened, but I, I'm happy that you, Chelsea, that you chimed in. So statins hurt my dad's liver and he had to have a transplant. So I mean, that, you know, there you go, statins. Uh, what do I think of organic palm shortening? I don't think it should be a part of the staple foods in your diet. Um, a lot of people will use it as, as a substitute for, for, you know, for baking. And I think if you're doing some mild amounts of baking that you could use it, but I don't, I, I don't want to say, yeah, I use it in, in lieu of butter or in lieu of, um, of healthy food. Any processed oil, whether it has an organic or not, you're better off eating the food over the processed oil. Um, that's just the nature of the beast. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I like that comment. I love all food, not all food loves me. 
Isn't that the truth? I mean, for everyone, I mean, that's really, that's, I mean, you, you kind of hit it right on the head with, with that comment because, um, you know, love is food, right? Life is food. Social in, uh, engagement is food. And we love to have food in loving relationships among people that we love and care about, right? And so, but sometimes it's, it, it's the doom or the downfall of us. And I think, I think part of what really has to happen in our society is just a respect and an honor for food and, and a respect and an honor for the individual and, and, and not, um, not calling people, um, you know, what we get in our industry, what we get in this arena is people call you, doctors will call you, orthorexic is the new diagnostic term for people who care about how they eat and what's in their diet. We also see words like health nut, right, that have evolved. Um, and this just comes from ignorance, right, of people who haven't accepted the fact that they need to change, probably need to change their diet or at least recognize that their diet is lacking in good proper health. Uh, and so they want to keep doing more of the same. And so we all struggle because as long as society normalizes eating things that aren't food and calling them food, we all struggle to connect with people in our society unless we find our core group of people and surround ourselves by that core group and really create definitions of normalcy and escape the Alice in Wonderlandian-like world that we're, uh, that we're living in. Because, I mean, today, good is bad, bad is good, up is down, down is up, healthy is sick, and sick is healthy. Uh, just look at the one of the more recent, you know, covers of the Cosmo magazine where they paraded like a 350-pound woman on there in a bathing suit and said, big is beautiful and healthy. And it's like, that's promotion of disease. It's insanity. Um, anyway, it's just not to say if you're overweight that you're a bad person. It's just simply say, let's call a spade a spade. Let's not call something a lie so that we, you know, you know so that we don't offend. And offense sometimes is the necessary truth to move the conversation forward in a way that everyone benefits, right? And to tell a perpetual lie keeps us stuck and plateaued in a state of perpetual confusion. And so then we look to experts to try to help us out of that perpetual confusion. And we have to be careful about the experts that we select because many of the experts aren't experts. Number one, pharmacist recommended products, not experts in nutrition, right? So um, it's, it's the marketing that, that really you know, tears us all apart and tears us down. What are your thoughts on these new home tests to identify individual digestion and what to eat take? I think, I think they're overstating their ability to help you with that information, um, Sandra. I think these new home tests are far, far, far away from any great degree of accuracy. Um, that's my experience with them and that's my um, my two cents. They're just not, they can't do what they claim they, they say they can do. Is RBC the best way to test for 6-3? I think I answered that. Yes. Red blood cell uh, membrane is one of the best ways to test for it. And there's too many questions. I don't know that I'm going to get through uh, many more of them. What, um, so what's the benefit of krill oil omega-3 over regular fish oil? I don't think there is one, honestly. Um, in my experience, we've used a lot of krill oil in, uh, clinically and compared it with omega-3 EPA DHA and krill oil in my experience is far inferior in terms of achieving an outcome or a result. So I'm not a fan of krill oil, uh, aside from the fact that it smells like the penguin habitat at the zoo when you open the bottle. I'm, n I'm not a fan of it. It's not to say, that, again, that it can't be a good source of DHA for you, but if you're trying to get EPA DHA balance, krill oil isn't where it's at. And the other problem with krill oil is pound for pound, you've got to take so many of those krill oil capsules just to match or meet one small capsule of EPA DHA. Okay, I got to go home. I'm hungry. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm 725, so we went 25 over the hour. So, hey, look, thank you so much for spending your Monday evening with me. Uh, if I didn't get to your question, you know, I apologize, but come back next Monday and, and uh, maybe we'll get to it then. 
in the meantime, do me a favor. Um, we're, we're getting ready to switch platforms. I know I keep saying that, but I want you guys to be ready when we make the move because when we, when we move our platform over, I don't, you know, I want, I'm going to be speaking a lot more frankly. Um, and I want you to be able to hear that truth and hear that, that knowledge. Um, and so make sure you go over to Gluten-Free Society and register or sign up for our newsletter. And that's how we stay in touch. It's how we keep in touch with you without the censorship. I can't control what the other platforms want to do or want to suppress. And frankly, I'm, I'm just tired of the suppression and I'm, I'm going to go where freedom rings. And that's, uh, that's on our own platform. So make sure you are on our platform if you want to keep getting this message. Thanks so much again for joining me. Have a fantastic week. We'll see you next Monday night. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is gonna allow us to remind you right before we go live, but it's also gonna allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.